Good morning, men. I've been reading a book recently called Good to Great by Jim Collins. Some of you may have already heard of this book. If not, you may have heard of its predecessor, uh, Built to Last. They're the fellows that coined the term BHAG, Big, Hairy, Audacious Goal. And at our ministry, we co-opted that to Big, Holy, Audacious Goal and have been following uh, their system, if you will, for several years. Uh, Collins has now written this new book called Good to Great. He calls it actually the prequel to Built to Last. And this is built on 15,000 hours of research. This is a very good book. There are a number of principles in the book, but the thesis of the book is basically this, that there are some companies that after, after a period of, and they measured 15 years of sort of average performance, there was some transition point that led to sustained growth that beat the general market performance by at least 300% for the next 15 years, so sort of a flat line performance, some transition event, and then 15 years of, of very strong growth. Companies uh, out of the Fortune 500 were selected and looked at. Only 11 companies made the cut. Companies that missed the cut include companies like Coca-Cola, GE, Intel, uh, Motorola, Walt. <laughs> and Walmart. <clears throat> so some very good companies miss the cut. They're not considered to be the good to great companies. And then what the, uh, the author and his research team did in this book is they looked at different industries and they took a comparison company which had good performance but did not have this meteoric rise and then uh, they looked at that side by side with what they call a good to great company. So you have the comparison company and then the good to great company. Now, there are a lot of really wonderful principles in the book. One of them has to do with the leadership style of the 11 CEOs of the good to great companies. Collins had the presupposition going into this that when people see a problem, uh, they just say, well, it's a leadership problem, so that everything boils down to leadership. And so when his research team started coming to him with reports about the difference in the executives, chief executives of these companies, he dismissed them. In fact, he said, so early in the project, I kept insisting, ignore the executives. But the research team kept pushing back. No, there is something consistently unusual about them. We can't ignore them. And I'd respond, but the comparison companies also had leaders, even some great leaders. So what's different? And back and forth they went. Finally, he writes, as should always be the case, the data won. The good to great executives were all cut from the same cloth. And it's interesting. He notes that in a lot of the comparison companies, there were some dynamic, charismatic, bigger-than-life leaders. But in all of the good to great companies, Without exception, without exception, the leaders were found to be men of compelling modesty and humility. In contrast to the very eye-centric style of the comparison leaders, we were struck by how the good to great leaders didn't even talk about themselves. It wasn't just false modesty. Those who worked with or wrote about the good to great leaders continually used words like quiet, humble, modest, reserved, shy, 
gracious, mild-mattered, self-effacing, understated, did not believe his own quippings, and so forth. Isn't that fascinating? That the very best, most excellent performing companies in the entire country, and there are only 11 of them that even made the cut, in every single case, at the helm of the organization was a CEO who was a humble man. We are looking at the subject of biblical manhood. And we are trying to build a little vision of what it means to be a biblical man. And so I said that what we were going to be exploring is the the question, who are the men we admire in the Bible and why and what do they have in common? And so when you start looking at men like Noah and Moses and Abraham and Joseph and Daniel and Peter and Paul and others. One of the things that I've been noticing uh, this week, one thing that they have in common is there's something going on in their hearts. There's something going on in their hearts that renders them to be humble men. Humble men. Jesus tells a parable. We could paraphrase the parable like this. There were two men who came to a Bible study one Friday morning. One man, his name was uh, Phil. And Phil is a very moral guy. A very moral guy. He's scrupulously honest. He's never cheated on his income taxes. He fasts on a regular basis. He tithes to his church, sometimes does more. He's a a deacon. He doesn't uh, cheat on his wife. He doesn't drink. He doesn't smoke. He doesn't look at the Victoria's Secret catalog. And he even asks his wife to screen out the swimsuit edition of Sports Illustrated when it comes. And he helps little old ladies across the street and helps the Humane Society get little lost dogs adopted into, into nice homes. So, so Phil came to the Bible study one morning. I know that some of you are identifying with Phil. <laughs> Phil walks in the door and he looks around and he sees Bob. And he thinks to himself, you know, I'm glad I'm not like Bob. You know, I know for a fact that Bob has not been paying his bills on time lately. And I find that disgusting. In fact, there's there's Peter over there. And and I happen to know that Peter is always in trouble with the Internal Revenue Service. He's had this this debt, this IRS debt that's been lingering over his head for a dozen years. And and he's never really taken care of it. And doesn't even seem to, 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 to want to try. Not only that, he smokes. Cigarettes! You know, I'm glad I'm not like Steve over there. You know, Steve has a son who's gay. Gay, you know, he's a gay. I'm glad I'm not like him. I'm glad my son's not like that. And then he gets a cup of coffee and he's standing next to a guy named William and He says, well, you know, I don't want to talk to William. William can't keep a job. I mean, you know, I don't want to get near him. Something like that might rub off on me. Besides, he hangs out with a lot of non-Christians. They cuss a lot. I know because I've I've heard him before. And then I'm glad I'm not like Phil. You know, Phil. Because, you know, Phil, he's got marriage problems. You know, if a man can't keep his wife in line, huh? 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 Glad I'm not like that. I'm glad that I'm glad that I'm a good churchman. I'm glad that I'm a Christian. I'm glad that that I have my life in order. And then there's the other guy, Phil, the guy with the marriage problem. Phil walks into the Bible study and he's shattered by what's going on in his life. You know, he did it his way. 
You know, I did it my way. I got exactly what I wanted. But in the process, you know, I neglected my wife. And she had an affair. And now she's left me. I'm trying to get her back. She's taking my kids too. I don't know if I can get them back or not. I don't know if I even have a chance here. He can barely talk to the men in his group without coming to tears. He's desperate for reconciliation with his wife, but he's even more consumed with a desperate hunger, a spiritual hunger for God. Phil looks at him and says, I can't believe Paul has so many problems. It's his own fault. What did he expect? He's just getting what he deserves. And that brings us to our text this morning. Luke chapter 18, verses 9 through 14. We'll read the whole passage, and then I'll give you a couple points and an idea you can carry away about biblical manhood. To some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everybody else, Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and one a tax collector or a publican, Pharisee and a publican, Pharisee Phil, publican Paul. The Pharisee stood up and prayed about himself, God, I thank you that I am not like all other men, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. No, I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all I get. But the tax collector, the publican, stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Here's the big idea for this morning. Even if you're right, you're wrong if you're not humble. Even if you're right, you're wrong. If you're not humble, I want to see a couple things together with you in the passage. First, in verses 9 through 12, we can do all the right things for all the wrong reasons. It is possible, men, to do all the right things for the wrong reasons. This Pharisee that we are talking about here, in our day and time, we think of Pharisee as a pejorative term. But remember, this was the most religious guy on the block. This was the, this was the guy that everybody would look at and say, well, now, wow, that's, that's a religious guy. He had his act together. But it also says, to some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on others. So Jesus looked at him. He saw that he was doing all the right things, but he saw a couple of problems too. First problem is that Pharisee Phil here had misunderstood the gospel. He thought that what it meant to be a Christian or a godly man, a follower of God, was to do works of righteousness, that he would justify himself. What does it mean to justify? What does the word justified mean? You know, we don't use this word so much. We should use it probably a lot more. To be justified means to be Legally, to be declared righteous before God. It's, the, it's God's declaration of our righteousness. And how are we declared righteous in the sight of God? Well, the Pharisee, Phil, he thought it was by doing the right things. He Doing the right things. Is doing the right things worthwhile? Sure. But not if you do it for the wrong reason. Not if you do it to gain your approval from God. Instead, we gain our approval from God, and then in gratitude for that, we do works as an expression of that gratitude. That's what the the gospel is. And this man is practicing works righteousness 
uh, works righteousness. Second problem, and so the, the, also the, 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 the idea here is, is that the something he's doing externally that's different than what's going on in his heart. He's doing all the things that look right on the outside, but in his heart he has all kinds of, what, bitterness and envy and jealousy and all kinds of thoughts that are going on, looking down on other people. Now, I know that doesn't apply to anybody here, but I just thought I'd mention it this morning. (laughs) Problem number two. Who said that? (laughs) You of all people, Fred. (laughs) So the first problem is, look, you want to teach or you want me to teach? (laughs) (laughs) So the first problem was is that he was doing uh, works of righteousness out of his own flesh, if you will. The second problem, he's looking down on other people. This is the problem of pride. C.S. Lewis, in Mere Christianity, calls pride the great sin. I want to read to you. There is one vice of which no man in the world is free, which everyone in the world loathes when he sees it in someone else, and of which hardly any people except Christians ever imagine that they themselves are guilty. I have heard people admit they are bad-tempered, or that they cannot keep their heads about girls or drink, or even that they are cowards. I do not think I have ever heard anyone who is not a Christian accuse himself of this vice, however. There is no fault which makes a man more unpopular, and no fault which we are more unconscious of in ourselves. And the more we have it ourselves, the more we dislike it in others. Oh, hey, oh, that stabs. That hurts. Oh, because, you know, there's, if there's one thing I really, I mean, you know, I try to love all men, you know, because I'm a righteous guy, okay? Yeah, all right, you know, I'll, I'll overlook everybody's fault. But one thing that really does secretly, now it's not so secret because I'm here to tell you, but really just really, really rankles me, and that's an arrogant guy. I mean, I can, I, can put, I can handle almost anything except an arrogant guy. It just really rankles me. And what does Lewis say? And the more we have it ourselves, the more we dislike it in others. <laughs> okay. Yeah, that's enough of Lewis. <laughs> He's dead anyway. What does he know? He says this. He says, the vice I am talking of is pride or self-conceit. And the virtue opposite to it in Christian morals is called what? Humility. Humility. According to Christian teachers, the essential vice, the utmost evil is pride. Unchastity, anger, greed, drunkenness, and all that are mere flea bites in comparison. It was through pride that the devil became the devil. Pride leads to every other vice. It is the complete anti-God state of mind. Pride. Pride. This Pharisee was looking down on other people. Phil, when he walked in to the Bible study, said, I don't want to be associated with that guy. He doesn't earn as much money as I do. So we have these two problems. We can do all the right things for the wrong reasons. One is works to gain righteousness, and the second is because of pride. I think part of this is the distinction between justice and mercy. We would like to qualify for God's justice, wouldn't we? But we don't. 
We would like to not need God's mercy, wouldn't we? But we do. It is pride that keeps us in denial from seeing our great need for the grace of God. All right. Now that you all have figured out that this doesn't apply to you, let me ask you this question. Can you worship God in a bar drinking a beer and smoking a cigarette? Can you worship God in a bar drinking a beer and smoking a cigarette? Now be careful before you just answer thinking that, you know, I'm looking for a particular answer here. I don't know. It's up to you. But I do know this. C.S. Lewis's preferred place of worshiping God was in a bar drinking beer and smoking cigarettes. I've been there over in Oxford, England. That's where he met with Tolkien, author of the Lord of the Rings, and they would have their meetings every day. And they would do what? They would drink beer and do what? Smoke cigarettes. Would anybody be so arrogant as to suggest that C.S. Lewis is not a Christian because he sat at the lamb and the flag or the, the bird and the baby? The two bars that he frequented or the pubs? Well, you might just want to ask yourself if you have a little Pharisee in you this morning. I'm not going to ask myself because I don't want to know. I've heard enough already this week about it. (laughs) The big idea this morning is, even if you're right, you're wrong if you're not humble. Even if you're right, if you're not humble, you're wrong. Jesus. Okay, let's take a look at the... Next, second thought here, from verses 13 and 14. The second thing I want you to see is that no matter what you've done, you can be forgiven. No matter what you've done, no matter what's going wrong in your life today, you can be forgiven. Jesus said, but the tax collector, the publican, stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God Have mercy on me, a sinner. God, have mercy on me, a sinner. When Paul walked in here this morning, he was broken. He was being humbled. And he said, Lord, I need help. Lord, I'm I'm coming here. Have mercy on me because I'm a sinful man. Verse 14, I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified or declared righteous in the sight of God. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled. God opposes the proud. And he who humbles himself will be exalted. God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. That's what the scriptures say. Before his downfall, a man's heart is proud. But humility comes before honor. Well, we have a little problem here because the problem is is that Paul really was a sinner. The publican here really was a sinner. The thing was is that he really knew that he was really a sinner. So he wasn't trying to pretend that he was something that he wasn't. In fact, he admitted it. Luther's famous question is, how can I, a sinner, be acceptable with a righteous and holy God? How can I, a sinner, be acceptable with a righteous and holy God? Here's your answer. God have mercy on me. God have mercy on me, a sinner. And then when we say this, 
And this is the act of repentance. This is the, the grace of God invading our lives, bringing us to repentance and faith. When we do this, what happens? And by the way, for the, for the person who was never a Christian, but also for who else? Those of us who are Christians. Because we all need. We're all sinful. We all have this pride. We all are looking down on other people. We all, all would hopefully like to be humble men. But the only way to do that is to come and say, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. Because even if you're right, you're wrong if you're not humble. Even if you're right. You can have your theology 100% correct. You can be the most orthodox person in Orlando, in Florida. You can be the most orthodox person in the entire nation. You can do everything scrupulously right. You can, you can cross every T and dot every I and, and you can tithe and you can say all the right things and you can spend your time in all the appropriate ways and still be wrong if you're not humble. And still be wrong if you're not humble. So which of these two guys got justified? The one who said, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. That was the answer to Luther's question. That's how we find our acceptance. Application this morning. Turn with me, if you would, to uh, 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 5. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 5. And we'll start at the second sentence of that. A couple of books, other books that I've been looking at this week that have a couple of interesting points to make. The book Humility by Andrew Murray. This is a classic old text. And... Murray calls humility the inseparable character of a godly man. The inseparable character of a godly man. Humility. Let me just read one thing, though, that's kind of interesting. He says, in their spiritual history, men have had times of great humbling and brokenness. All of us have had times of great humbling and brokenness. But what a different thing... This is from being clothed with humility and from having a humble spirit. I started this week out totally wrong on this. I was going to talk to you about being broken this morning as kind of the first big step in this series. Last week we did the wiring diagram. So I thought I was going to be coming here talking to you about brokenness, that we need to be broken. And we do need to be broken. Well, what Murray helped me see, and then also Watson, another Puritan writer, what they helped me see is that you can be broken in a moment. Uh, You can be humbled. You can have your circumstances humbled and still have a proud heart. Or you can be humbled for a season until things start to get better, and then you get back to your old ways. There's a difference between being broken and being humble, having a humble heart, a humble heart. Is different than just being broken. Make sense? Here's what Watson says about it. I distinguish between being humbled and humble. A man may be humbled and not humble. A sinner may be humbled by affliction. His condition is low, but not his disposition. Ha! Oh, okay. I tell you what, I, I've had a hard week, guys. <laughs> I mean, it's been tough this week. You know, okay, his condition is low, but not his position. I'm thinking about how I've been humbled. So, so many times, I've been humbled this week a couple of times, fellas. And uh, that's why I really resent having to give this talk this morning. <laughs> In a humble sort of way, of course. It says his condition is low, but not his disposition. And you know what? I realized that when I was being humbled these two times this week, 
There's so much anger inside of me about it. You know, on the outside, I'm, I'm doing it exactly like you're supposed to. It looks good. If you would have been observing me, you'd say, you know, Pat, yeah, he's a humble guy. He's, you know, he's suffering for Christ, you know. But my disposition was pretty sour this week. In fact, it was even sour when I got up this morning, to be honest with you. In fact, no, it's not still there. It says his condition is low, but not his disposition. Can you say that of yourself? A godly man is not only humbled, but humble. His heart is as low as his condition. Whoa. Now, that's what these two guys said, but here's what Peter said in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 5, second sentence. Clothe yourselves with humility toward one another. Clothe yourselves with humility toward one another because... God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Luther said this. He said, if you see yourself as a little sinner, then you will only think that you need a little Savior. But if you see yourself as a big sinner you will understand that you need a big Savior. Even if you're right. If you're not humble, you're still wrong. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, oh God, I don't want to be a big sinner. I want to be a little sinner. But Lord, I'm a big sinner. And every time I come here, I see it more clearly. Every time I go to my church, I see it more clearly. Every time I read your, your word, I see it more clearly. Every time I'm talking in a group with other brothers, I see it more clearly. I am a big sinner, Lord. Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. Lord, I don't want to get it wrong. I want to get it right. Lord, help me not just to be broken not just to be humbled, but Lord, give me a disposition to be humble. Amen.